We want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south as we bring you our latest teaching in the Gospel of Mark. Today we will be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. We have titled this, The True Rock. There's a lot of misteaching about Mark 8, when the Christ, the Messiah, calls Peter Cephas, which in the Greek means rock, uh, that he is the Pope. We'll explain how this was taken out of context, and it's not even good history. So we will get into that, but before we do, I was raising my hands. I felt the Holy Spirit. If you clicked on just before we start praying, we invite the Holy Spirit to come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living Word of God, which is our Savior Christ the Lord. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit in us who guides us and teaches us in our daily, our daily bread. And this chapter is talking about bread, literal bread and spiritual manna that can only come from the bread of life, which is our Messiah, the Christ. And as I was raising my hand, I heard military jets go over our house. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but we're in the Gospel of Matthew, or I'm in Gallic Math, or the Gospel of Mark. We will be uh, quoting Jesus in Matthew 16, 13 through 20, and uh, so that we can put this in, in context. Remember, the Bible always has to be put in context. We have to go to the original language, with this was ri written in Greek, to find out some key, key things. So this is feeding the 4,000. This story is also told in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 15, verses 32 through 39. These are two separate events. We know the Gospel of John tells us that the first blessing, which was the five uh, and the two fish, were barley. Barley is always the first harvest, so that would be the time of the Passover. So this was to a Jewish audience. The second blessing... We can tell by the numbers, because the numbers in the Holy Spirit, always the numbers mean something. Again, that's called expositional constancy. That's just a fancy theological term to say the Holy Spirit is always consistent in its symbols, its numbers, its idioms, everything. So we know by the numbers, this miracle that we're talking about is to the Gentiles. Okay, so this would be closer to Pentecost, 50 days from the, uh, the, the this would be the wheat harvest. All right, so let's get into it. We'll explain. They are two different events. We'll highlight the numbers because the numbers mean everything and also the baskets because they're translated wrong. We have this assumption that the first miracle where Jesus had the five loaves of bread and the two, uh, the two fish, they had 12 baskets. 12 is the completion of the nation of Israel. Uh, but the basket is being told there is a small basket, like a little picnic basket. The basket they're going to talk about with the seven is like a hamper. So it's a bigger basket to store more. There is more Gentiles coming in than, than uh, the Jewish people. So this is to a dual audience because the Christ is the Messiah for the Jews and the Gentiles to come in through him to be one, the church, the ecclesia. All right, and we're going to talk about the ecclesia. That's what he meant by the rock that only his father in heaven knew about. And don't listen to man. It will come from the father. All right, in those days, the multitude being very great and have nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to them and said, I have compassion, and he is, the, he is the compassionate one. He had compassion on these people because they were three days out, a three-day journey. Always in the scripture, three days. It's the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, always three days. Three is always a number to the, uh, to, to the Trinity. Also is in Hebrew, is the completion of the spirit of Elohim the one God who manifests in three. Again, grammatically in the Hebrew, Elohim in Hebrew, grammatically means three. Not one, not two, not four, but exactly three. And that is the completion of God's spirit. And that's why it was such a big deal when Jesus uh, raised Naz or Ra uh, Lazarus from the dead. Because no man could raise the, um, uh, somebody from the dead after three days. They believed in Judaism uh, in the Jewish tradition that the spirit that left the earth after the third day. So if somebody was dead for four days, no man could bring him back. And that's why four is the mankind, is the world. So had compassion and they continued for three days and had nothing to eat. Uh, can you imagine going three days, nothing to eat? My wife was telling me about a fast uh, yesterday about how good it is for you. And I'm like, three days, that's a long time to go on a fast. Uh, and the bread in Israel is outstanding. We're, we're just in the preparation stages of our next trip to Israel, and we're going to combine it with the footprints of Paul, 
So now you start thinking about the, the bread in Israel is, is outstanding. Uh, and if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way. For some of them have come from afar. They've come a long way to see the Christ, the miracles he is doing. No man can do these miracles. He's more than a, he's more than a prophet. What is he? Is he, the, is he the son of David? Then his disciples served him. How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? Remember, he saw, they saw the miracle before. They don't think he can do it again? They said seven. Seven this time. Seven is the number of completion. God is going to complete through his Messiah, Jesus Christ, who literally comes down on the seventh day to complete. That is why we celebrate the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the Sabbath was created for the Son of Man, which is Christ, the seventh day. Completion. That's why A.W. Pink, in, this, in his study of the book of Revelation shows that there's over a hundred sevens in the book of Revelation because it's the completion of the Messiah and it's completion of the earth age, it's completion of the world where the Messiah will come down and rule and reign from Jerusalem. So that's what seven means, seven is completion. So he, command, he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took seven loaves and gave them thanks and broke them and gave them to his disciples and sat before them and they sat before the multitude. They also had few small fish Having blessed that, he said to them also before them. So they ate and were filled. The, the, the Greek word means it was like all-you-can-eat buffet. They were beyond. It wasn't just a morsel. They were full. Kind of like how full I was when I was in Israel. The food was so good. Each time I was saying before I got away, I, I can't take any more. I can't take any more. But oh, one more bite. Well, I'm in Israel. I might as well. That's how full they were. So they ate and were full and took up seven large baskets and leftover fragments. Our English does not give this word justice. I'm not going to pronounce the, the, uh, the, the Greek word here. But the Greek word here for the seven baskets, it means a hamper. It's like a hamper. When my wife goes up and gets the boys' clothing, it's a hamper. It's filled with a lot, far more than the 12, which is like a little picnic basket. So we now have eaten in about 4,000. Why is he telling us four? Four is the number of the world. This is the test of the world. Jesus is coming down to be the Messiah of the world, grafted into the original vine, which is the Jewish people. Jews and Gentiles, as the Apostle Paul tells us, grafted in to become one, the ecclesia. Christ is the head, one spirit, one baptism. Immediately they go to the boat with the disciples and came to the region across. The Pharisees seek a sign. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, just like the Pharisees, again, creating their, all their oral laws, and they want to dispute with the, the, the author of the word. He is the word. Seeking him for a sign from heaven, testing him. They see all these miracles. They know, or at least they should know based on the scriptures, because remember, they believe the Torah is a holy book, the five books of Moses, and they believe the prophets. That's what the Pharisees do. But they took on all the, legal, the legalistic things of the Levites, which they were not supposed to. God separated that for a reason. And they're looking, and they're still asking the Messiah for a sign when he's done all these miracles. And he's matched the scripture exactly the way the prophet said, the way Moses said. Then the Pharisees and became to dispute him. But he sighed deeply in the spirit. Jesus, oh Jesus, well, how much he loves us. He sighs. He's like, will this generation never learn? Will this generation never pay attention? Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Because you're seeking with your eyes. It's about the heart. You should know who I am. I am that I am. I am the one in the burning bush. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Again, leaven. This is another expositional constancy. That's why out of six out of seven of the Hebrew festivals is a requirement that there is no leaven in the bread. Leaven is an idiom of sin. So this is what Jesus is referring to. They know how to make bread and they need the yeast. The yeast is what the leaven is to make it puff. It sins in two ways, representing sin in two ways. One, what does yeast do? Leaven do? It puffs up. Pride. God sent a Satan out of heaven because of his pride because he was creating man in the image of Elohim. So pride, God, can't, God cannot handle the pride. We've got to give up pride for him. We've got to give up self for his, for his glory. 
And if it's left unchecked in the loaf of bread, what does leaven do or yeast do? It spreads beyond throughout the loaf. It spreads through the entire church. It's got to be dealt with. That's why there is no leaven out of six out of seven of the festivals. What is the only festival that you can have leaven in the bread? It is Shabbat. That is Pentecost. That is the day Christ started his church. When he went up, the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost and the church, because he overcame sin. He is the great overcomer of sin. He is the, the Passover lamb. And then left and getting in the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not, ha they did not have any more, more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he changed, it charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He's referring to their false doctrine. He's referring to them spreading the wrong thing of sin. Beware of what they're teaching. Beware of bringing this into the true ecclesia, to the true church that I'm going to start. Beware of that. Not the physical bread, the spiritual bread. That's what he's referring to. And they're thinking of real bread. How is he going to, they don't have enough bread when he just did two miracles. And they reason among themselves saying, it's because we have no bread. And, but Jesus became, became aware of it and said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? I'm not talking about little bread. Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? That's the key word right there. It's about the heart. They're thinking from their mind. They're thinking through the intellect of the world instead of capturing what the Lord is telling us through the heart. That's how we know the, the word of the Lord is through the heart. It's the only way. We have to read it on the, on, a, on the compass of our heart and meet him in the Holy of Holies. If you try to read the Bible as a man and you try to put it up here in your intellect, you're never going to get that. That's what the Pharisees did. That's legalistic. God has always wanted to meet us in the heart, the Holy of Holies, the Word. That's what Jesus is telling you. Is your heart still hardened? He didn't say your eyes. He said your heart. Having eyes, you don't see. You have eyes, but you're not seeing me, the bread, the, the rock. And having ears, you don't hear. You're not listening. You're not listening to my quiet voice. And do you not remember? Do you not remember the two separate miracles, one to the Jews and one to the Gentiles? When I broke five loaves for 5,000, five is the number of grace. It's through grace through the Jews and it's grace through the Gentiles. But the first one was about the, Gent or about the Jews. Five, the five books of Moses. Five is grace, the 5,000. How many full fragments did you take up? Say to him, 12. 12 is the completion of Israel in the Bible. 12 disciples, uh, 12 apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel. The word here in the Greek for the five loaves that the fragments were taking up means a smaller basket. So yes, the number was bigger, but the baskets were smaller. Much more was taken up for the second miracle than the first because there's more Gentiles than there are Jews. But we can all be get the bread of life through one Messiah, through one Christ, as long as we take him in our heart and he becomes the bread of life for us. He is our rock. Uh, and then he, broke this, uh, the, then he broke the five loaves and the 5,000. He said, how many do you have? Twelve. Also, when he broke the seven, seven again now, this is for the Gentile audience. Seven is completion, the earth age. Four thousand, four is the world. How many large baskets? The word here means hamper, so they're much larger, larger baskets. Did you take up seven? Double seven is completion. So he said to them, how is it that you don't understand what I've just showed you? It's to the Jews and the Gentiles, I am the bread of life. A blinded man healed in Bethsaida. Then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and he begged him to touch him. So he touched the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. When he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him and asked him if he saw anything. Many people ask, well, why did Jesus spit? It's an ancient Jewish tradition that when you spit the, the, the saliva of the firstborn of the son, of the, of the father, which Christ is the firstborn of the father in heaven, there is a special anointing, there's a special blessing, there's a special, uh, there's, there's a special in the spit. So that's what Jesus spit. Remember he did it in the mud before too, and he spits, and this allows this man to, it was his faith that allowed him to see, but Jesus used the saliva. So he took the blind man and, and let him out of town, he spit in his eyes, but he put his hand on it. He asked him if he saw anything. The spitting is also a way of the kinsman redeemer too in our book of Ruth, the rejection. Uh, 
And he looked and said, and so I saw, I see a man like trees walking. So he was seeing men like trees. This is the first time he's seen. Then he put his hands on his eyes and he made him look up and he was restored and saw everything clearly. He, he, it's like in Israel, they have this new uh, drop that you can put on your eye and it make you see like you were when you were younger. They're still in the beginning stages of this of, of ramp out. I hope by the time we go to our next trip to Israel, which may be in August, uh, that they have it ready so I can go and do that myself. I want to be able to see clearly, both short and long. He was being able to see clearly because the creator of the heavens and the earth allowed him to do that. But he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he restored and he saw everything clearly. Verse 26, then he sent him away to his house and said, neither going into town nor tell anyone in this town. The timing was not yet. So Jesus told him, not yet. Do not tell anyone. It was your faith that made you healed. Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ. All right, this is also told, taught, told, uh, taught, showed us in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, Luke 9, 18 through 20. Um, the gospel, we're obviously reading this in the gospel of Mark. It doesn't say anything about the rock that Cephas on this rock, uh, my church was established. The Gospel of John doesn't say anything about this too. This is where some in the Catholic Church have said that Peter is the Pope. Uh, big problem with that. One, the, the history of the Roman Catholic Church is that they never declared Peter to be the Pope until the thousandth year. That was something that was added a thousand years after Christ. And also, that's not what the Scripture says. We have to put it in context. You've got to read it in the Greek. It's very, very clear. And if he was really the Pope, we'll show you many reasons why he wasn't the Pope. If he was really the Pope, Jesus would have said it in all four Gospels. He also would have said after what, he, we'll, we'll explain it in Matthew 16. We'll read from Matthew 16. It'll make perfect sense. Now, Jesus and his disciples went out to the town of Caesarea Philippi. And then road they asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say I am? Remember this, this man. But some think the son of David, some think Elijah, some think the, Mos the prophet that Moses was talking about. They, saw, they heard about John the Baptist. Who is this man? Who is this prophet? More than a prophet. Who is he? Who, is, who do men say he is? So they answered him and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. Others, one of the prophets. The reason that some say Elijah, they know Elijah was coming back again. It's in the book of Malachi. And he said to them, what do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter, in the Greek, means Cephas, means rock. That's a pun. But that's, Jesus is not saying that Peter is the Pope. He's <laughs> not building Christianity on Peter. It's the doctrine that he's talking about. Who do men say I am, meaning the Christ? And we'll put it in context in Matthew 16. Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And that doctrine is what was basing the rock. Then he strictly warned them that he should not tell no one about him. So if Peter was a pope, Jesus would have gone on with this, which he's clearly not. Let's read it from Matthew 16. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not, uh, this was not revealed to you by man. What I'm about to tell you, the rock, the Messiah, the church, the ecclesia, which was a mystery that Paul talked about in the Old Testament. It wasn't by man on the earth that's revealing this to you. It's by God in heaven. It is by the Holy Spirit. It is not by man-made doctrine. Jesus is very clear on this. But by my Father in heaven who is revealing this. And I tell you, you are Peter, meaning Cephas, rock. It's a pun, but not he is the Pope. And this rock, this rock, meaning this doctrine that I'm talking about, that you say I am the Christ, which I am, that rock, that doctrine builds the church. And I will build my church and the, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So the gates of hell will not overcome it. A couple chapters later, Peter, we're going to see here that Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. So if Peter was the Pope, he became Satan real quick. And we also know Peter went on to deny Christ three times. Peter got it right in the end because he said, I love you three times, because he denied the Christ three times. So we have to make sure that we read the Bible in context, in the Greek, and all four Gospels together, and knowing the Old Testament, and piece by piece, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. 
so that man cannot change the doctrine, especially after a thousand years. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, they strictly warned them they should tell no one. Math, um, Mark 8, 31. Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. This is Matthew 16, 21 through 23. Luke 9, 21 through 22. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must mu suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Three days, three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So three, he's telling them, I shall die. My death shall bring, bring comfort and joy. Uh, as we said that many times in the, um, in the Old Testament, in the, uh, I don't have that right with me, but I will bring that up again, where it is actually in Genesis, in code, what Jesus is referring to. I usually have that right next to me. We'll, we'll do it another time. He spoke, uh, he spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter is rebuking. So Peter now becomes a pope and is rebuking the Christ. Does that sound kind of familiar right now, that the pope is rebuking the true word of God? Uh, it doesn't work that way. He's not, he's not the pope. <laughs> but when he had turned around and looked at the disciples, uh, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. Hmm, might be a pun there, too. For you are not mindful of the things of Theos, God in the, in the Greek, but the things of man, Theos, the highest form of divinity. Uh, take up the cross and follow him. This is Mark 8, 34. This is also in the Gospel of Matthew 16, 24 through 27. The Gospel of Luke 9, 23 through 26. When he called upon the people to himself and his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Boy, that's a lot of word right there. Whoever desires to come after me, whoever wants to serve the living Christ, they must deny himself. That means giving up the leaven inside your own bread. That means giving up your pride, giving up yourself for him and letting God mold you, let God guide you, let the potter mold the clay. We are the clay, he is the potter. He is the molder. Letting him do it, getting rid of self, getting the leaven out of us. And we've got to bear our cross. Whoa, I don't want to bear a cross. People want to die for Christ, but they don't want to bear their cross for Christ. Because it's heavy carrying the cross for Christ. And it's heavy carrying the cross, bearing the cross, and following him because you will be persecuted for his namesake. He said so. Certainly they will persecute you because they've persecuted me. But I... The, 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 the way, the truth, and the life have overcome death. I am the way, the truth, and life. Follow me. Are you willing to bear your cross for him? Because when you accept Lord Jesus Christ in your Lord, as Lord of your life, that's step one. Salvation has come home. You're going to be home. You've punched your card. However, your job just begins. And it's whatever you do for him at that point that matters that will be on the beam seat that Paul talks about. And we must bear our cross and deny ourselves and put him first. Well, wait a minute. You got me at salvation. But do I really want to deny myself and, 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 and give up all the things of the world and take up a cross and bear it and follow you? It's easier to die for Christ, as Chuck Messler used to say. It's easy to die for Christ. But can you walk for Christ? Dying is boom. It's over. You'll be in, you're in heaven. But each day, you have to pick up your cross and walk for him. That's why we're tested in this earth. And it's only what we do for him. We're tested because of the things that come upon him, not because of the sin we do. Our tests are because of what we do for him. And you will be tested. And you have to bear the cross, and you have to follow him, and you have to overcome. And that's why we need the church, the ecclesia, the body, to lift each other up because it is a battle. But the battle was won on Calvary. We have to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him. I'm in, Lord. Pick me. I'll do it. Whatever it is, Lord. I've died three times. What's another? But it's harder to bear the cross. For whoever desires, desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Whoever gives up self for the gospel's sake and my sake, me, the Christ, the way, the truth, and the life will save your life eternally. Eternally we were with him. And eternity is forever. 
We're here just a small spin, smidgen of time. Time flies by so fast. And it's only what we do for him that matters. And it's eternity with him. And we don't want to go to the Bema seat and have regrets. What did you do with the gifts, the talents I gave you, my son or daughter? I didn't do anything with them. That's a sad day, you see. For what profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? We have a lot of rich people. We have a lot of bad Oreos in the world today. The light of Christ is coming out to shine what they've done in darkness. Well, I'm looking at one right now speaking, and I'm going to tell you who it is. What is it good to profit, profit a man and gain the whole world to be a billionaire, to cheat, lie, steal, to bring down empires, to, to kill, to murder? If you lost your soul for eternity, it's all about the soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We see what some have given in exchange for the soul. But that time's going to come up. It's going to be punched. And then what are you going to do? Eternity and damnation is a long time. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when, it comes in the, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Wow. Whoever is ashamed of me, the Christ, and my words. He didn't say, I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed of you, Jesus. You are the Christ. And a lot of Christians say, yeah, you, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. But you know what? I don't really think your word is that legit today. I don't like this part. 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 But this little part in here, I love Jesus. Okay, I'll take that part. He didn't say to pick it apart. He said all of it. For whoever is ashamed of me and my word, this is his word, all 66 books, precept upon precept. In this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed. You'll be ashamed. You have to, if you love him, you're going to be obedient to his word. And when he comes in the glory of his Father, when we pray that prayer, your kingdom come on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. What a glorious day it will be when the Messiah comes. But the key is when he comes, or you're taken to heaven before he comes, will you, will you get to that beam of seat and say, hear the words from him, well done, my faithful servant? Or will you have that tear of regret? Did you follow him? Did you bear your cross? Did you follow his word, all of his word? It's his word. People ask me all the time being a pastor. What do you think about X, Y, Z in the Bible? And I say, what do you mean, what do I think about it? It's not my opinion. It's, I'm a Marine. Like in the Marines, you follow lawful orders when you're in the Marine Corps. When you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you follow lawful orders. He wrote the orders. I didn't. I'm called to be a servant and to be obedient to what he wrote. It's not an editorial on what I think. He is God. I am not. I give up self for his purpose and his glory. It's all about him. And when we can give up self for his purpose and his glory, oh, we get a tax, but it's worth it. It's worth it. As the Apostle Paul says, finish the race. Even if we have to crawl across the finish line, finish the race. We pray that Mark 8 has been a blessing to you. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you today and always. Shalom.